Good early afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Border, and I am an instructor for the Professional Personal Development Center at Penn State University. And I'm very pleased to be here with you today to um, hopefully have a, a some dialogue. I know we're in a webinar, but um, Sonia and I feel really passionate about what we're going to talk about today. And hopefully it will stimulate your thinking about your uh, own preparation of your students for college and career readiness. So Sonia, I'm going to turn this over to you while I share my screen. Okay. Hello and good morning. Thank you for joining us. My name again is Sonia Robinson and like Maria, I am an instructor in the Professional Personal Development Center. Um, we're excited to share with you some key points and resources on how we can make our students career ready, but I like to take it a step further that and say we're not only getting them career ready, but we're getting them life ready. So we're providing them with skills that will not only have them survive, but thrive in life. And so we're eager to get started. And as soon as Maria brings up the presentation, we can get going. Okay, can you guys see this? Can you see it, Sonia, or no? I can see it, but you might wanna put it in the presentation. Yeah, okay. Um, so everyone, for the purposes of our um, session today we wanted to have some interaction and um i would like you if you would to use your cell phones and i know you're i'm sure you're pair decked out and everything else but if you could join pd.com and please go ahead and once you see the window you know enter the the password usv fxb because sonia and i do have some we wanted to do some breakout rooms but we're not able to do that but we do need some feedback from you um as well. So if you could please connect, um, I would appreciate that. And I'm not sure how this will work with 100 participants, but we're just going to go with it. Um, and if we need to enable chat, are we able to do that if this doesn't work? Erin? Um, yes. Okay. All right. So, so we have a backup. So you can join, you don't have to join obviously, but it would help us to get a better feel for what, what our audience is composed of and um, some of the things we wanna talk about and really think about today. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the class here in one minute. You may have to sign in with Google. <clears throat> give you a minute to do that. And while you're doing that, um, the purpose for this presentation is really because I, I used to be a CTE teacher and a nurse. So my personal experience with career um, development and college readiness was, hey, pick a college and get accepted and then you're on your way. And um, my high school pretty much washed their hands of me. So when I went to school. Obviously, I was a criminology major. I had no clue what I wanted to do. I had no life experience. My parents had never gone to college. My dad was in the military. My mom was a housewife. Um, so they didn't really ever prompt me to, to choose a career. So what had happened is I basically chose nursing, which worked out really well for me, thank goodness. But you know, for a lot of kids, that does not work out very well for them. So I've I've been blessed in that way. And I think that I think there's a huge disconnect between what a, a CTE teacher does, school counselors do, and administrators do, that we really need to take a look at um, and you know increase those connections to help our students become more successful. I think that's key. And there's barriers to, you know, that happening for everybody. Um, I know school counselors are extremely overburdened, CTE teachers as well currently, and administrators have their own set of worries. Um, I do not profess to be a school counselor and neither does Sonia, but this presentation is basically brought about from my own life experience and my experience um, as a teacher. Uh, and I used to teach at Huntington County Career and Tech. So um, I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, hopefully we have enough people connected. I apologize if um, I missed anybody, but I would like to you know, continue um, this so that we can actually get through the presentation. Okay, all right. So 
Um, when I was little, I don't know how many of you remember this book, but I really liked the little nursing uniform. And it's really ironic that I became a nurse, but I thought she looked so cute. And that's how I basically made my career choice. So I want you to think back, um, you know, to when you were younger and what your career aspirations were as we go through this. At this point as well, if you could please choose an option here. Are you an administrator, a school counselor, a teacher, or other? Um, I would just kind of like to know who's in our crowd here. We have some school counselors, looks like majority of instructors, co-op coordinators, and other. If you're other, can you type into the chat box what, what your other is, please? <laughs> Just curious. Sorry. Okay, so it looks like we have a lot of instructors School counselors, administrators are taking up the rear on this one. Uh, Co-op coordinators and other. Erin, do you see in chat what other is? Yes, we have um, some CTE facilitators, uh, transition coordinators, the CTE facilitator for special ed, um, uh, Department of Education, BCTE, College Event and Communication Specialists, Paraeducators, Career gotcha. Counselors. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so, um, wow, we have a lot of others um, in here, but we welcome everybody because we all know that it takes a concerted effort from all of these groups and, of course, the parents and community to help our students become truly college and career ready. So I'm going to go ahead and thank you all for um you know, adding your thoughts to the, to our poll in our Paradex slides. We appreciate it. Sonia? Okay, so I, looking at this slide, I just want, you know, each and every one of us just to think back to when we were younger, what your, what was your dream job? Um, what did you, you know, that famous question that, you know, we're often asked and we often ask our students, what, do you want to be when you grow up? Now for me, and I, I'm from, for those of you who don't know me, I'm from the island of Jamaica and I wanted to be an actor. We don't have many famous actors from Jamaica. So when I, obviously that was not supported. And so I was encouraged, firmly encouraged to look in other directions. And so my professional development has, while it has been consistent, has varied over the years. So fun fact, I am a trained guidance counselor. So I was a counselor at a local high school in Jamaica. Um, I then went on and I went into human resources. And from there, I went back into education and I was a business lecturer at a local community college before I came to Penn State University to pursue my degree. So think about it. What did you want to be? And then I, my follow-up question is, why didn't you, if you didn't end up where you are now, why didn't you want, why did you not end up there? So you can, ooh, accountant working with money. Police officer, welder, fabricator. No one to work in healthcare. Wow. Dentist. <laughs> nice. Firefighter. I'm sorry, my computer skills today are not great. So to those of you, I like this, to become a veterinarian or a police mm -hmm. officer, mm -hmm. um, I want you guys to think about it. What about what you put into this um, slide? What was your skill set 
at that point mm -hmm. that would think that you could become a veterinarian or a police officer and maybe you were too young to really think about your skill set i obviously was you know teenagers don't really think about our skill sets because we're thinking about friday night but think about it like maybe if one of my teachers had made me realize what my skills were and fostered those skills or a school counselor or administrator um you know, maybe I would have become an advertising executive. That's what I wanted to do in high school. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but like I never really thought about my skill set and what would enable me to do that or not able to do that. Um, so think about that stuff. And um, we did this presentation a while ago and we had a, a young man say that he wanted to be a pilot. And we asked him why he never became that. And he said he never really felt he could actually do it, mm. um, even though he did have some of the skills. So, you know, it, it's really important that we allow our students to envision themselves um, within reason in a certain career and be frank and honest with them about what their great skills are and maybe what they're not so great at and how that might fit into a lot of different professions. So, Sonia, did you want to say anything else about that? No, but it, I just find that it's interesting that looking at the responses, two jumped out at me. The one that said they wanted to be a dentist, but they had one bad job shattering experience. And that to me is important because there are times when we think we want to do something, but then we find out that's not the case. And I think job shattering is so important in, in preparing students for careers because we might find, a student might find if, I go and visit a particular organization and I, you know, I shadow somebody, they might find that that's not the job for them. And they might end up in a field, as you said before, that they can use similar skill sets, but in a different field. Um, so I think that's important to know. So you can move on to the next slide, Maria. All right, keep calm and choose a career. I don't know about anybody else, but when I look at this slide, I feel anything but calm. And think about, and I like to think I'm a much mature individual. Think about that 15, 16 year old who's being asked to choose a career and decide where they want to be for the next, well, until retirement, right? And we have all these different professions being thrust at them. We often say to kids, choose one, right? But it's not that easy because one, we're individuals, we constantly evolve and grow. We constantly are exposed to new things. We see what's happening around us with COVID-19 in a way in which business operates will change, the way in which we operate as educators will change. So this is something that we ourselves need to consider that when we teach a student, we're teaching them a particular trade, maybe we need to say to them, you're learning this particular skill set, but that this skill set can be used in different ways. Maria, is there anything else you want to add to that? Um, yeah, and just as I think about our CTE programs, you know, we have programs of studies, mm -hmm. and I think that's excellent. We do provide a great uh, base for we our do. students to learn and grow, but I know when I taught nurse aid, the nurse aid program, that was like the end-all be-all for my students, and mm -hmm. I honestly, I never really taught them about the other professions that they could do. I mean, a couple, but like there are so many professions within a cohort that our students don't even know about. So yeah. I think that we mm -hmm. kind of limit them by not exposing them to as many careers as we can within that cohort. And we all know that um, today's environment, you might have six or seven jobs. So you really need to be focusing yes. on the student yeah. skill set itself, um, not just the specific career. So I just wanted to you know, throw that out there. Sonia, are we good to move on? We are. Okay, so 
Erin, I'm going to use chat for this because um, I don't really, I can't really see all the responses that I would like to see, but we're going to give you all about three uncomfortable minutes <laughs> um, to add your thoughts to chat because I'd like you to really, I want you to brainstorm if you're a teacher, what do you do to help your students prepare for college slash post-secondary training and careers for real, be frank and honest. And for all of you, what are you currently doing in your role that is helping your students become prepared for college and careers? So um, if you don't mind putting that into chat, um, then everybody can see it. And um, I just think we're gonna get a, a couple better ideas by looking at everybody's. So if you guys want to go ahead and type into chat exactly, you know, what are you currently doing in your school or for your students to prepare them for college or careers? Erin, are they able to do that? Yep, yes, they're yes, able they to are. type. Yep. Am I missing? Type there. If you hit your chat, if you hit the chat bubble that's at the bottom of your screen with the options, you should the chat, the chat box should come up. So you'll be able so to see. So Leanne that. said career inventory. Allison said career day. Virtual uh, Colleen career tours. Aaron shares his own stories. There are a number of things: portfolios, presentations, job shadowing. Ooh, it's going faster than I can go. Um, college reps visiting, mock interviews. This is excellent. Internship opportunities. Web-based learning. Yes. I'm reading them too, Sonia. Good. Okay. Personal budgets, building a resume, cover letter. Mm. I think the Myers Briggs one is interesting. Can I go back? Myers Briggs. I see Laura does the connections to um, through Career Link. Mm hmm. This is all fantastic. This is good. Myers Briggs, that's a good one too. Mm -hmm. mm. It looks like Dana's being extremely proactive with the coding. <laughs> that's cool. Kim says that they're doing more classroom lessons for career training, which I think is excellent. And I think it would be extremely powerful to, to pair up with the teacher and do that as well. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most important things is recognizing that, you know, counselors, school counselors have their list of to do things where it comes to career preparation and of course our, our teachers our cte teachers have their list of things that they have to achieve um within the classroom but the idea i think we're trying to put across is how we can get both groups to collaborate to make career prep easier and more diverse for students um and hopefully we will be providing you guys with some resources and some ideas of how to do that. Yeah, and you all are doing some really awesome stuff. They I just are. Want to, yeah, mm -hmm. and um, will we be able to save this chat as well and send this to the participants? Erin, I'm sorry, I'm being a pain. No, oh, yes, the, um, the chat will be saved and um, the recording will be available and any handouts you wanna share. Perfect, thank you. And then, um, because they can also get some ideas just from looking at chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. Fragmented versus holistic. I think uh, just to follow up on what I was saying just now is we each have our to-do list of how we get students ready, right? And I think there are different moving parts. The idea is how can we take those moving parts to create a whole, 
to make that preparation more holistic. So it's like creating a quilt. The quilt is different, um, different patches and you are trying to create a whole. So the fact is that students need to see themselves as post-secondary students and employees. It's not enough for us to just check a box that student, to say that students have explored a particular career or picked a school. Um, we need to ensure that our prep is not necessarily fragmented, but me more streamlined to ensure student success. Um, so how do we help students realize their potential and their skill sets and recognize opportunities? So th the thing is, one of the things I often encourage educators to do is you have to put some of the responsibility on the students, right? We have to say to them, this is your life. I mean, you're going to be teaching, but when you leave my classroom as a student, when you leave my classroom, what's next for you? So how do we engage them? How do we empower them through what we are teaching them? How are we putting the many pieces together to create this whole individual? Um, so that's something that we, we need to, to, to start thinking about. Um, how do we create the whole picture? Yeah, and, and teachers, you're, you're a piece of the quilt, uh, mm. school counselors, administrators, you as well, and those others too. Um, we all need to work together in some manner to create a holistic college and career experience for our students and allow them to visualize themselves as successful as a successful post-secondary student and um, as a successful nurse or a phlebotomist or a welder, you know, whatever they want to become, it's our job to empower them and make them realize their potential and also make them realize when they've hit a barrier and change their plan. And this is not anything new. Everybody knows this. Um, and Sonia and I are just going to, um, at the end of this, we're going to talk about some resources and things as well. But Sonia, I'm going to go ahead and uh, okay. go to the next slide. Okay. So oh, self-efficacy. Um, I remember as a teenager that the idea of, of um, you know, whether or not I could achieve a particular goal and it has to come from somewhere. And, you know, it's this idea of, do you truly believe in yourself? And I was of the mind that it, it has to be intrinsic, right? But then I started to think about it. Many of our students are not intrinsically motivated. So they don't have that thing inside them that says, I'm going to, I can do this. I will do this, right? And they need someone to give them that extra push. So how do we teach students self-efficacy? How do we teach them the importance of believing in themselves and it starts in the classroom. It starts in our career prep sessions. How do we get them to identify, okay, what are your strengths and weakness? What are the things that you like to do? Um, maybe do your, you know, right now I'm teaching you to become a nurse aide, but what are the skills that you really like? What aspects of this job are that you're learning about that you could see yourself doing in five, 10 years? Okay, let's do some, career exploration, what other jobs are in the health field that can I can transition into that might be more suited to my skill set. And it's and it's encouraging them, right? When they achieve something, and even when they don't do as well as they could do, it's a it's sitting down with them and saying, okay, I see where you tried, but how could we do it better? Right? Right. I, I think that you hit the point very well there, Sonia. And I do think that, you know, our role as educators is to help our students expand their learning and clarify their beliefs um, about what they're able to do 
and what they're not able to do realistically. So if I have a student that maybe can take a temperature, um, but is unable to draw blood, you know, that's mm. going to limit her as mm -hmm. to what she can do in health in health, the, her health career. So, um, but there's a lot of different professions she could choose from. So that's just kind of like a throwing out of an example there, but it's not just teaching the students about careers. Mm -hmm. It's really teaching them about their capabilities. And yes. once they know they have, they have mastered a skill and they're able to do a skill, um, they actually start to believe in themselves and, you know, they believe that, um, they've succeeded seated at tasks and that are like tasks performed by other members of that occupation that you're teaching them about. And I think that's important that we say, hey, you know, today in class, you guys learned how to do a blood pressure. Well, nurses do blood pressures, uh, phlebotomist, not likely, but you also have nurse perfusionist, you have um, medical assistants, like you just kind of need to expand that and say, hey, look, you, you've done this skill well, and this skill also fits into these other occupations nicely, but it may look a little differently. So we're really challenging you to develop your students' self-efficacy, um, not just the career uh, knowledge. So mm -hmm. I know it's overwhelming to think about all this, everyone, I know that, but self-efficacy is huge. And if you've ever had a teacher or a school counselor tell you that you'll never be able to do what you want to do, mm. oh my gosh, it's just devastating to students. And, and yes, some students are not able to do that because of a, like a learning disability or an issue. We do know that, but like to hear that from someone instead of, hey, you know what, you do this really well. And so um, maybe this you don't, you need to work on, you don't do this so well. So maybe we need to focus on looking at these other careers as well. So um, I, I think it's all about the presentation too. You know, how do you handle those students that do come up uh, with barriers um, to allow them to see other opportunities, which takes a lot of time, but yeah. is really important. So, Sonia, you ready for me to move on? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. In the past, CTE curriculum was designed with specific purpose, right? With specific purpose to provide technical skills and train workers for certain occupations. Um, so we're we're preparing we preparing students to go immediately into the workforce, but we know that the workplace has evolved and it is evolving rapidly. We have you know, can we how what is the the what is I keep saying lab is what is it going to look like now because of the COVID pandemic. Um, technology, new and, and improved technology is being introduced. So the way in which we are preparing people naturally will, will change. Um, so instead of looking at it from, listen, you have to check box A, B, C, and D. How about we look at it in terms of, okay, maybe we checked box A, but box B is not necessarily important. So it's, it's basically the ladder versus the ladder lattice sorry um so we have to start looking at things differently and i know maria is going to go more in depth in the next slide but we can't be as rigid in our thinking um and we can't allow our students to be in, as rigid in their thinking agreed and um so just as an example and nurse aid programs are definitely a special a situation because you have to dedicate so many hours to a nurse aid program and you can't teach your student anything else except mm -hmm. for that nurse aid curriculum. However, when I had students, I had them sophomore, junior, senior. So what mm -hmm. was I doing when they were sophomores? What was I doing when they were juniors? I had very limited uh, career exposure. I focused on the skills. Uh, I could have very easily integrated, hey, at the end of the day, let's do a journal reflection on. So pick three different occupations in healthcare. What does infection control or gloving and gowning look like maybe for a medical assistant in an office, how does that look different than a nurse aide in a long-term care facility? And there are differences, you know, and just the, the concept is the same, but the setting is different. So it's important that you allow your students to think like that too. Like, what might this look like? What might this skill look like in these different settings and in these different, different jobs? And that's how they learn about different professions and what those skill sets might look like. So if you look at the ladder, there's only one way up and one mm -hmm. way down, very narrow thinking. And I think 
it's good. Our CTE programs were designed this way. We were supposed to, you know, get our students up and running and into a career. That's excellent. But, you know, we can help our students expand their thinking if we do this lattice climbing, which you can actually um, go anyway, um, hopefully right. up diagonal, horizontal. Um, so, we, you know, we want to challenge you to think about that um, because technology has changed the job market. And just as that, that person had said in chat, she's training her students for coding because, you know, she sees the projective, the projected growth in that. So I think that's excellent. And this is a good um, way to mm. expand our thoughts about what we're teaching. All right, I'm going to go ahead and go on. So mm. Sonia, I'm sorry, what else did you want to say? No, I just I just wanted to add that, you know, the idea behind this is that, you know, you're focusing on building students capabilities, allowing them to consider other career paths, expanding their perspectives, so they're not as linear in their thinking and they don't have blinders on. Um, it's just an opportunity for them to grow. And yes, you can move on now, Maria. Okay. And this is just, I'm not going to spend a lot a lot of time. It's just a visual um, for you to, to look at this. Again, a nurse aid program, very specific, very focused. There's major parameters. There's a clear beginning and ending process, whereas, you know, with some of our occupations, there's not a clear beginning and ending process. Um, and you can actually look at the skill sets and apply those to many uh, careers within your cohort. And then if you look here, um, you know, a more linear, I'm sorry, more <laughs> expansive way of thinking is this lattice type grid where your students have that choice and opportunity and change in perspective. So, you know, like nurse aides possess skills that complement many other professions. I've often said that a doctors would be excellent if they had to start out as a nurse aide because it expands their perspective about patient care, um, what nurses do, what nurse aides do. Um, it's just really I think it just complements other professions if you look at the skill set within your own profession. Um, and obviously a perfusionist is, you know, an advanced degree, but you know what, it's not unlikely that someday our students may become that. I've had students become RNs. I've had students um, go on and get their bachelor's degree. So it's just, you don't know where your students are going to go, but you can't see the progress while you're teaching them. You only see it years later. So um, again, this is like a career lattice pathway. And obviously you can see down below the community health worker, personal caregiver, CNA is a nurse aide. Um, nurse aide is the term we use in Pennsylvania, not certified nurse aide, just FYI. Um, pharmacy clerk aide, phlebotomist, you know, you could become a pharmacy tech, you guys can look at this and just see there is a range of occupations that you could be teaching about. And I think most of us do this. Um, already but beyond that there's also other occupations that you can also expose your students to as well in addition to all of these um, this is an example of i believe this was from careertech.org um, and it's under career clusters which is included in your um, resource packet which we're going to show you but if i had had this list when i was teaching health occupations it would have helped me to give this list to my students and actually said hey you know this week i want you to pick three occupations and we're going to really look at those and we're going to look at the skill sets in our zip code and we're going to kind of cross reference to see hey you know i think we could do this skill as a medical coder uh, we may do this skill from our SIP code or program of study um, if we wanted to become a forensic pathologist. So it, it just really expands their thinking. Um, and also it'll expand yours as a teacher. And uh, definitely, I don't know about all of these occupations, so I would have to learn about them as well. Um, but I could also do that alongside my students. So it could be like a student problem-based learning project, um, something like that. So just throwing that out there, you know, take a look at your career cluster list, see what's out there and see what is available and see what the options are for students within your cohort and allow them to see the choices as well. Okay, so now I want to get to some stuff that I never thought about as an instructor. And it's kind of sad because we all know, we all know which students um, really don't have great home lives. We know which students don't come from a, you know, a stable family and possibly they have a low uh, income. So it's pretty obvious for most of us as instructors, school counselors, administrators, and my other people out there. But 
what are the, uh, the hidden things that we don't really think about? And I didn't really think about this. So um, I it's just, I'm going to use myself. Um, I came from a middle income family and I was able to, through school, pick up the norms of what college life might look like for me. Um, what was normal for me, you know, as far as networking, uh, what was normal for interactions with teachers. Like I could pick that up just from the culture within my school, but we have students that go to schools that are um, not, they don't have many resources and those students don't learn those norms. They don't learn what life is going to be like in college. So it's not enough for us to be like, hey, you got into school, good luck, you know, I wish you the best. We need to let our students think of themselves from as soon as they hit our doors as potential post-secondary students, college students, whatever you want to call it, because we all know that some degree of training is probably going to have to occur for most of our students. So um, here's what I, I think that I missed. Um, I could have better serviced my students had I used college or post-secondary vocabulary in class. You know, what what is a bursar's office? What's registration for courses? You know, you could say, you know, when you pick your your courses for school, like career and tech, your health occupations course, that's called registration in college. Um, that kind of stuff is really important. It's a complete vocabulary list. Our students should know about that. Some students think office hours legit are the hours that professors do not want to be bothered. And mm -hmm. that is scary. So they don't ever go see that person. They don't self-advocate if they need help. Um, also, uh, I think as well, um, you know, we have our students look at schools that are well known. And I'm gonna challenge you all right now in your heads, because I know we're short on time. Um, list seven colleges you could probably name. Obviously, first one came to my mind was Penn State, uh, Pitt, uh, University of Penn, uh, Temple University, the very well-known colleges, right? So what if you had your students as students brainstorm a list of five to 10 colleges and you would get, you know, the brand name colleges and I'm not trying to bust on Penn State because, you know, we are Penn State. Um, mm -hmm. It's awesome. But do we serve our students well? Maybe we should say, okay, you have your list of five. I want you to wad that up and throw it out. Now I want you to get online and search for the lesser known colleges. And um, they could still do the big name colleges, but look at the resources for the students and all of those colleges, because you know there are different resources in different schools and colleges and post-secondary institutions and training institutions. Your students need to know what those resources are. It's not just about the name um, or the low tuition. It's what can that school do for your student and how do we assimilate that student as best as we can into college and post-secondary life before they leave our classroom. So, um, you know, the, the lack of cultural knowledge, the, the doubly disadvantaged poor income students need an extra push. And we as school counselors, teachers, administrators, and others um, have a duty to, you know, expose them to that stuff prior to them leaving our doors to give them the best start that they can. Um, lastly, I want you to think about, you know, if they are low income and they go to school, and the school closes for the winter. I mean, think about COVID right now. Um, how are your students going to eat if the, the the meal halls are closed? You know, Where how are they, they going to live? Eat? Yeah, like you want your students to think about all these scenarios before they leave. And I know that you might say that's not our job, but it does help our students with an advantage when they start because they've already thought about these barriers. Um, and there's only so much we can do. I understand. But I do think, you know, we, a little bit more focus on that kind of stuff would go a long way. Sonia, do I need to add anything or do you want to add anything before I move on? No, I think you've about covered it. Okay. Okay, so this slide here is just basically um, to, and I know you all know this, but I just thought it was representative of some of the characteristics of holistic career and college prep. So, you know, like we're always supportive, individualized teaching, 
I think is really important. Connections are extremely important. Resources are at the center, which are extremely, extremely important. Um, collaboration between teachers, uh, school counselors, administrators, and other, I think is so important. Integration. I think we really need to integrate this kind of information, just like we do math and reading. Like, I think it is that important. Um, especially have being a mother of two college age students myself like I don't want them to waste a lot of money um, if they you know I want them to succeed it's it's important so this is just a slide that represents the most common um, things that, that people have thought about when we talk about holistic college and career prep so now comes the the part of the presentation that I know I already saw a bunch of stuff that you did on your chat, which you have excellent things going on, but I really want you to go back to chat and I want you to evaluate what you cons what you do already, what you currently do. And then I really want you to up the ante on your career in college preparedness, which would be an intervention and then an adjustment. So I'd like you to think about what you wrote and how you can flip it or up the ante um, you know, on what you're already doing. For instance, say, oh, I used to go to career fairs um, and I had students that went to career fairs and I know um, some of my colleagues are, are on this, in this meeting and they've been to those career fairs with me. And I found that my students really liked collecting all the items off the tables and had very superficial conversation with the people um, that were at those tables. So career fairs are great, but they're superficial. Like if you had to do a Bloom's taxonomy for career fairs, it would be just really low. Like app, it's definitely not application. It's basically just regurgitating content and not exposing students to what that career is really about. So to up the ante, you know, I would challenge you to, obviously we can't in this COVID world, but I would literally challenge you when we can um, to have a career fair where you actually have simulations at each station that students, you know, your CTSOs may be involved in this, your school um, with your OACs, have some simulations set up so that the students can actually participate in something or a skill that is reflective of that career. In addition to all the fluffy stuff like the pens and everything, but there needs to be a deeper connection at career fairs. Uh, you could literally do a simulation fair. You know, it obviously would take some time to plan this, but you could, once you did plan it, you could run it year to year to year um, and add to it. So that's just an example of upping the ante um, on what you currently do. So now I'm going to ask you to go ahead and use chat again, if you would, because this is what I want you, just with our conversation, hopefully it, stimulated you to think a little bit and maybe it didn't because like I said I'm not a school counselor um, this yeah. is my perspective but if you could please reflect on what you placed in chat originally and then put any new ideas that you might have for your college or career prep um, into chat for about three minutes and again this is a resource for everyone in this uh, training or webinar, I should say. And then um, Sonia and I are actually going to look at that. And then we're going to share some ideas and resources with you that we have mm. um, crowdsourced for you. So if you could go ahead, two minutes, chat. How are you going to up your ante for your college and career prep if you are? And maybe, you know, maybe you decide you don't need to, and that's fine. Yeah, job shadowing. Mm, mm -hmm. And I see Christine, one of the ideas that um, we have in our slide resources is when you have guest speakers, it's really cool if they're mystery guest speakers, like say you have a panel and you take the panel from the career list. Um, so you have maybe a couple different, maybe you have a phlebotomist, maybe a psychiatrist, a forensic scientist, an RN, whatever, and have the students ask them questions and try to figure out what their job is based on their skill set. So I think, you know, you could have a lot of fun with this. Um, Right. as well. And I think one of the things when we go back to the list of colleges and throwing out colleges and including colleges, one of the things we need to also consider is 
Penn State is obviously one of the biggest universities, not the biggest university in Pennsylvania, but Penn State also has satellite campuses, right? And so some students might do better at the smaller campus than they would do at say University Park. Um, I have a friend now who is in the doctoral program and she says if she had come to University Park when she was doing her undergrad, she don't think she doesn't think that she would be as successful as she is now. So those are some things that we need to have students consider. Maybe not coming to the main, I hate that term, main campus, but going to one of the smaller campuses or exploring, you know, if I'm going to apply to a college, I'm not just applying to a college because it has the name, but it also has the program or programs that I'm interested in and how good are those programs. Right, that's good, Sonia. And there's some really good chat here. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully you guys will use your chat as resources as well. Um, I, in the interest of time, Sonia, I'm gonna go ahead and show them the resources. Great. Um, okay, so everybody, thank you for participating. And I, we have a couple resources to show you that are pretty awesome. Um, Sonia and I crowdsourced a bunch of things for you. If you could scan this QR code uh, with your phone, it'll take you to a wakelet um, that we created. And you can also click here to access the resources. And if anybody needs me to send this to you, you just email me and I'll send you our um, Wakelet link and our, our slideshow. But if you look here, I do have our presentation here, but I have some ideas for you, career journaling ideas that um, health occupations, you're, you're in school, and yeah, in class instructor, sorry, or remote, you could literally pick one of these for a student reflection um, at any time. And so I have a couple prompts here for you. And hopefully I'm not making you dizzy. But um, I'm Maria, go back up to the QR code. Somebody wanted to see it. Again. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. I guess I did that pretty fast. I apologize. Did you get it? Yeah. Yes, she did. Move on. Okay, great. Um, okay. Nope, that's not what I want. All right. So there are, if I remember, exactly. there's 40. 47 items, 48 items on here to give you some ideas to up your ante for your uh, preparation. One of those I thought was great. This one was, you know, start a classroom high school career, cl career club, do it on Fridays, but you could do a first generation uh, college student club as well. Um, I'm not gonna stay long on there. I had talked about the panel of speakers that have different jobs, they're mystery speakers. What's wrong with career exploration? Remember we just hit on, um, hey, your career fair needs to be a little bit more hands-on, that this whole article explains it. And when you get to here, all you gotta do is click on this and it'll take you to the site. Um, something that I did with my students and I actually had them do a budget and choose an apartment and a car and everything to you know, kind of demonstrate what real life might look like if they worked as a nurse aide and most of them only had eggs to eat at the end of the week, but that was all on paper. This Texas reality check does it online. So they literally can choose their uh, career. And I know it's Texas, but it's still a good exercise for students. Um, and it assigns them a salary and then they can choose their apartment and their car and mm. the way they wanna live. And it actually is a great eye opener for your students. Um, I have the college list challenge here. I'd seen somebody news, use Naviance um, in the chat earlier. They have great resources. So you just have to go under the resource tab. This uh, virtual college tours, uh, virtual reality, many college tours. There's a lot of Penn, Pennsylvania college tours. And even if your students aren't going to a big college, you know, you might want to have them do this as a, an assignment. Tour three college campuses virtually and, you know, write down your reflection or what are your opinions about each one and why. Um, get your students thinking about that. You could also have your students interview a college student and report any issues or themes noted uh, for a first year student and report their barriers out. Actually have your students fill out a mock college application. Most of those are online, we all know that. But um, you know the exercise is good. They could actually use what they put on this mock college application and apply that to online. 
Um, again, ready to go checklist you need before college. I love this. It's like, I'm going to click on this. We have three minutes. Um, these are great. What's your emotional prep look like? Uh, financial prep, we all know is huge and school counselors, I know you're instrumental in all of their financial prep and, and stuff. A lot of times logistical preparation, you know, what might this look like um, before you move into a dorm? You, you might have to walk up three flights of stairs to get your stuff upstairs to your room. Um, and then the stuff, you know, what are you going to need? What are your basics you're going to need? I know this sounds crazy, but students need this stuff. We often just take for granted that they know what they're doing, and that's not always the case. And of course, scholarships are always lovely too. Um, again, how to prepare for su successful college semester. Um, also an idea, have your students create a career podcast. Podcasts are free online. Um, Anchor, I think, is free. Highlighting the skills and education necessary to be successful in the field. You could have them interview people. Um, get creative. You know, use your CTSO as a platform for this or develop a club within your school that literally highlights certain careers. We have also included a student networking manual here. Honest to gosh, this is like 300 pages of um, activities and information about how you can help your students. It's called Teaching Networking Skills, Paving a Way to Jobs and Careers. I have a vocabulary list for college. Um, I have the idea here as well with some suggestions. Um, one teacher, we crowdsourced allowed our students to research at schools and they created t-shirts with their club money and they literally had like a college or uh, a training day where they discussed what their college was they chose and why. And then of course we have career tech, career cluster pathways, career ready PA is a great source browsed by career cluster ONET. Everybody knows about that. This boot camp, make sure you take a look at this PDF. There's some great stuff in there. Um, we also have some sources to help your students develop grit and um, do a career cluster interest survey. There's just a bunch of stuff. We have the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, and then we have some ideas for teacher and school counselor uh, working together, ideas for them working together, and job simulations. Teaching simulations are really important and a real life fair, which could be a spinoff of your career fair. So you can take a look at these at your leisure. Um, self-efficacy toolkit, <laughs> but we wanted to give you lots and lots of resources to up your ante. And I think that I am done with this. So um, we appreciate your time and uh, reach out to us. Let me just get off of here if I can. And, you know, Sonia and I would be willing to continue the conversation uh, with all of you. Um, I did have a slide here, but I apparently. I'm entering our email addresses in the chat. Yes, please. And, um, yeah, please email, email us if you have any questions or you want to continue the conversation because, you know, we're very passionate about, passionate about this and um, we hope you have a great afternoon.